Welcome and thank you for joining this symposium on systemic racism, the time for reckoning. My name is Paul Grandal. I'm the director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. We're very excited for our guest today, uh, Roger Mark D'Souza. I'll say a little bit more about him in a moment. We are pre-recording this interview. It will be part of our October symposium. We're very grateful that Roger Mark uh, made this time available for us. He is the chief movement building officer for Amnesty International USA. He oversees research and programs designed to document human rights abuses and directs Amnesty International USA's work to grow, diversify, train, and deepen the engagement of its membership base in order to leverage the organization's grassroots activism through, uh, from the local to the global. Welcome, Roger Mark. Thank you very much, Paul. It's good, great to be here with you today. So that's quite a title. And I know you've, I, I didn't give your whole resume. It, it's very impressive. You've been at the Wilson Center, Sister Cities International, other major organizations, uh, Sierra Club. How do you build a movement? I mean, that's in your title. That's, that's how do you do that? How do you build a movement? And particularly for, for this symposium, your whole work, uh, and I would direct all of the people to the Amnesty International USA's website, a whole incredible uh, resource on deadly force and police accountability. Yeah. So how do you build a movement around this and, and how do you tie into the Black Lives Matter movement and other organizations? Yeah. That it, it really is a critical question at this moment in time. And I think one of the key components of movement building, and I think even for those of us who have worked um, in the journalistic space, is to be able to present a compelling face, the human face and the story that is emblematic and provides insight into trends and opportunities so that folks can understand what is happening and mobilize around that. And that is very important because you want to make sure that as you think about that, you're not doing that in an opportunistic way. You want to be very genuine, true to the narrative. You want to be in allyship and partnership with those whose lives are being directly affected. So I think because Amnesty International has such a well-established brand as the largest and oldest human rights organization in the world, and that brand is international, we are part of an international movement that involves several million members that are predispositioned to look at where human rights violations occur and to find opportunities to take action. So our role at the organization is to document these, valid, these uh, violations, get them out as widely as possible, to work in partnership with others, to tell compelling stories, and to provide opportunities to take action where you feel you're making progress. And I think those are some of the key elements of building a movement. Yeah, I mean, you have such reach and organizations so well known. And I love the logo uh, and, and behind you on the screen, that idea of the light and the candle coming out of the barbed wire. I believe it's yes. barbed wire, but, but Correct. the beauty of, of, of light and illumination in some of the darkest places. I mean, you've been yes. doing a lot on the border, which, which is not part of this conversation per se, but the effectiveness of, of social media in Amnesty International USA is, is powerful. I'm looking at your, your uh, page on deadly force and police accountability, and here's the, the uh, tweet, the Twitter account that comes up at the top. Stop killing black people. Stop attacking peaceful protesters. Stop enabling racism and white supremacy. Stop arresting journalists. Stop allowing police violence. Just stop. That's powerful, I mean, you know? it, it, it really is powerful. And, you know, when we think of those whose lives are being directly impacted, we see that we're all part of humanity and it ultimately affects us all. And what we keep hearing from human rights defenders is stop, 
stop. This needs to stop. And we have tried to very specifically think about how we can document this. And I know that one of the things you and I had chatted about a little bit was looking at different ways to present that information. Okay. And we had uh, worked on a project, which is an interactive map that shows excessive and unnecessary use of force by police. And this yeah, is- I wanted to highlight that. I know. Albany, <laughs> New York is in it and, and, and not in a good way when our police yeah. turn tear gas and, yes. and on our protesters, a peaceful protest. But you look at the dots, it's everywhere in this country. There, there's yeah. not an area that's out of it. So one, how do you build that? How do you get that information? You must have a lot of resources. It, it, it's a power. Well, I think this is part of being a movement. We work with our international secretariat that is in London, um, and we work together with, we have a crisis response team there, and we have a citizen evidence lab. And they work together with our stellar research team here in the United States. And we reviewed close to 500 videos and photos that had been posted online from a variety of folks, from journalists, protest medics, protesters, legal observers. And then we supplemented that with interviews with 50 individuals who had been on the front lines to get their experiences. And then we looked at specific instances and got verifiable information on those, on those particular instances from a variety of perspectives to corroborate it. And then we use some of our digital verification techniques to figure out, okay, where was this occurring? What are landmarks that we can use to verify the information so we know that it's true and accurate? And how, we, how do we do that with some metadata analysis? So this was the documentation and the research behind this effort, because we want to be sure that the information that we're putting out is reliable. I respect that. As a journalist, so I immediately clicked on Albany and looked, and I, and I yeah. know your sources. I know some of them personally. Yeah. What really is powerful to me, and I believe ta Coates said, what's different is that people have cell phones now. We're recording this abuse and these killings they went on, they've gone on for hundreds of years, obviously, but now yes. we're recording. You are marshalling really, you know, citizen journalists. Anyone with a cell phone can now document and, 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 and make it stop, right? Right. Yeah. And, it's, and there's that documentation, but the verification and right. confirmation of that from a variety of sources is what is very compelling. It is so easy to capture something on film, but you have to contextualize and verify so that it can stand up as evidence. And verify <laughs> is important. As we learned in the 2016 election, I, yeah. I fear we're going to learn again. There are a lot of people who are trying to spread disinformation, to do deep fakes, or to do, so how do you verify? I mean, I think that is the crucial thing that, that Amnesty brings to this, you know? How, how do yeah. you verify? So it is, it is that triangulation of information. It is multiple sources for very specific evidence. It is the metadata analysis. It is verifying the content. And we do things even like checking the angle of the sun to verify the time of day when a piece of content is captured. It's, it's you know, so that is kind of nerdy and crazy in a way, but that, those are the things that we are doing to ensure that the information that we put out there is accurate. And, you know, Paul, you talk about aligning with uh, partners in the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements. What, what we have found is increasingly our partners who don't have that verification capacity are coming to amnesty and saying, explain your data and information for us so that they themselves can then also take it up and use it. So we work in solidarity with them um, and we support each other in that way. That's so important because this is a battle. I mean, 
you see Blue Lives Matter pushing back. You see certain, you know, uh, far right elements pushing back, wanting to basically muddy the waters, wanting to discredit. So your verification, I think, is is crucial. Um, I, I finally see. I'm glad that Facebook and other you know large platforms are starting to do that. A little late if you're a multi billion dollar corporation, I would say, but I'm glad they're starting to do it. But let's talk about. I, I, I like how Amnesty always calls to action. You know, young people. And this is, I think you are connected to young people far better than, than a lot of other organizations, but young people want to act. Yeah. They don't want to just, you know, read a book or do it. They, they want to act. So what are the ways you have different ways on your website, how you can act? I mean, going out in the street and protesting is only one. There are, there are other ways. There are tons of ways. We have very vibrant student groups. Um, and some of these are the elementary school, a lot are at high school, and more and more at the college level. Um, and they work with academic advisors that provide them with a series of opportunities to take action. One of the key opportunities that we have across the global movement is a letter writing campaign. And this gets, you know, a lot of the young people that we work with want to go out in the street. They, they want to protest. We support the right to peaceful protest and we support um, doing so safely at this moment. At the same time, we want to demonstrate that there are other ways. So writing a letter to your congressperson, highlighting a specific violation of a specific case is an important opportunity. So we do that through a program that's called Right for Rights. And this year, typically it's 10 international human rights violation cases. This year we actually have a case that highlights uh, gun violence, uh, particularly among our black and, and brown brothers and sisters. And we have a case of a young woman, her name is Tiona Lefton. She's 18 years old from Chicago. And as she graduated, her day of graduation from high school, she went to the gas station to get something to drink and they were all socially distancing and somebody drove by and shot shot at them she was shot and was injured she called the police several times about the shooter they hung up on her they never turned up she was not informed about any compensation opportunities and so now she has these expensive medical bills she's had to undergo surgery plans for college are delayed there's no accountability there's no compensation so we're tr um, shedding a light on her case so that there's an opportunity um, to take action, write letters, and mobilize around her case. So it's highlighting these individual cases through letter, rise, uh, letter writing, through taking action online, to also reach out to the individuals, but to decision makers at the national level and the local level to um, understand these stories, to examine them, and to take action. I will say I get all your materials because full disclosure, as you know, our daughter Caroline works for Amnesty International. She got involved while she was a student at Fordham University in New York. Yeah. As you're saying, there's, there's students. I mean, this is on our campus, 18,000 students at the University at Albany. They are a force. I mean, and they want to change the world and they, they want to have an impact. So I do get your materials and I love how you tell stories. I mean, storytelling is the most basic connection and you put a face on, you know, whether it's an issue in, in halfway across the world in, in, in Africa or whether it's at the border. Yeah. And this is, you know, these are our cities. This is Albany, Schenectady, Troy. This is, this is you know, the capital region. You, you're, you're taking up that issue. But let me ask you, um, how do you measure? I mean, if, if you had to have 100 young people how many would you say go to the streets? No, it's better to write letters. No, it might be better to do another action. Is there a return on investment that's better with one or do you have to do all of them simultaneously or? I think you have to do all of them simultaneously. Um, at times, it, it depends on the particular case or the issue at hand. And other times it depends on who you're working with. 
Um, so who are your partners on a particular issue? So, you know, we, we talk about the violence um, against our, our Black community and the importance of racial equity. Um, another dimension that we have worked on is looking at Indigenous rights. And just um, this week, there was a huge act that was passed. It's called the Savannah's Act, and it looks at the rights of missing and murdered Indigenous girls and women. And we work in partnership with a number of indigenous groups that were mobilizing young people around these issues. And when we, so it took us a long, a long time to get here, to get this act passed, and it's just a start. But you're asking about, well, what matrix do you look at if you're looking at your successful contribution to getting an act like this passed? Number one, it's not in isolation. It's, it's various forces coming together and looking at how you maximize your role at Amnesty International in conjunction with others and doing that through developing deep partnerships. So some of the matrix that we look at is around our ability to sustain and support partnerships and at times to elevate the voices of others through a, a good brand like Amnesty. But at times you have to know when to stay step back and went a step forward. So it's matrix around those things. Um, we sent out um, an SMS last week around Savannah Act and we got more than a thousand calls. Uh, this was a higher response rate. So we were saying, call in to um, your decision makers on this issue. We got more than a thousand calls last week. So that was good. That's a good matrix. We have produced um, um, documentaries or discussions around films that have highlighted these issues and then look at actions that have been so we look at how many people come to our discussion on this forum how many people take action subsequently how many of these individuals are new action takers and how many of them are super action takers for us so then they take six or more actions right. so it's providing a space that's culturally resonant inviting people in following up and engaging with meaningful content content and keeping that movement going and sustained over time. And these are some of the things that we look at. And how do you keep the passion and, and not get depressed? You see the Breonna Taylor outcome. You know, people took to the streets, people did everything. And here's a woman, a black woman shot five or six times in her bed while she's sleeping. Police officers get off. That this happens time and again. It's well documented. How do you keep the actions and, and, and not feel like you're just defeated and want to give up? How do you keep the energy and momentum going when there's so many such discouraging outcomes like that? Yeah, I would say there are times that we hear directly from the victim's families and they say, your work is important. It's making a difference. You continue to shed a light. Um, a lot of our campaigns have resulted in individuals being freed from detention. We recently had a case that we are working on to free families from ICE detention centers. We got a transgender woman from Honduras who had been in ICE detention for more than a year released through the action of our members. Numbers. So when you see the opportunities to make a difference and you keep at it and you see a result, that is what keeps us going. We know ultimately um, when um, a police officer gets a, 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 um, a briefing from us um, on uh, police violence and we hear that 
that was actually insightful. We want to engage in a conversation with you. We don't fully agree with everything that you're saying, but we want to have some dialogue. When we see those kinds of opportunities, we know that we're making a difference. And we know that with our brand and name, we have a responsibility to leverage that so that we continue to seek out those opportunities. And particularly on policing, this is what our symposium is getting at. It, it's such a closed system and, and such a, you know, blue brotherhood in a way. It's, it's very tough to crack. They protect their own. The police unions are very strong. They're pushing back very strongly with a lot of resources in a way like the NRA in, an, in a different sort of way. You know, a lot of resources. I'm sure you've battled the NRA on a lot of, a lot of uh, issues and a lot of fronts. How can you move the needle if the police force is so insulated and, and, and not responsible? You know, you don't vote them out like we get a chance every four years in this country. And, and uh, um, but, but how do you crack that police force, you know, closed system with such power? You know, it, it, it's a really good point. And I would say, um, not, we know that there are a number of police officers and law enforcement officials who are doing the right thing, right. right? We have to be very careful about that. We've documented that. And I would say we even have a lot of our staff who their families are law enforcement families also. Yeah. So we're very careful that it's not, you know, a broad brush. What, what we talk about is uh, the opportunities to engage in dialogue and provide training for police officers. So it's a question of how do you monitor a protest? When do you resort to, to the measures that are being used? Is it an excessive use of force? Is it the first resort, which it should not be? We point out international agreements and guidelines and approaches that have been developed that provide a road, um, a, a pathway that can be followed. So we look at those opportunities, um, we document carefully, we find opportunities to look at the disconnect between what's happening in other countries and here, and we seek to open up that space for engagement and dialogue, and we keep at it, we keep at it over time. It is really a persistence. Do you have any, you know, sort of out of bounds? So a perfect example, locally, there's been some cases uh, where police have gotten off and the, the young black activist groups have put out the home addresses of the officers and encouraged members to go and get aggressive in front of the homes. Now, is that a tactic? Would you condone that? Would you not? I mean, what are your limits? I would say, you know, we... Um, that is not part of the tactics that we use. We tend to stay away from individuals' homes. We will not involve their families or children. You know, if we, for example, right now, we're looking at freeing families from ICE detention, and we have a series of billboards um, that are being put up and that are being put up against um, um, very large trucks that are being uh, going through certain areas. So we would do that in workplace areas. We would do that where there um, are folks are congregating. We would not go to individuals' homes or families. No, that's a, that would be a red line for us. Okay. And you've been at this work in, in different capacities for a long time. I, I want to get a one to 10 level of optimism because it feels like the world is falling apart. We've got wildfires in California. We've mm. got a, a huge refugee camp in, in Greece burned out that these are people fleeing a civil war with no end. I don't know, going on 10 years in Syria. We've got massive unemployment in this country, people who are going to food banks at record levels to, you know, and, and, and we've got this, this racial, strife at a fever pitch more than probably any time in our country. Where do you find optimism and hope and, and in, in the long career you've had in this, where are we right now? Are you more hopeful or less hopeful than you were 20 years ago or 25 years ago? Or 
That's a, the, you sound like my son. My, son. <laughs> my daughter's the one that's, that's pushing me because she works for Amnesty and she said, you got to do something, dad. And I know we're trying. Yeah. So my son who is, um, he's now 24. He said to me, dad, um, are you very optimistic now? Or, or were you more optimistic when you started your career? And I said, where do you come up with these questions? And I would say, you know, honestly, it, it changes. It varies day by day um, with what's going on. The, where I see the greatest optimism is a recognition of the, um, racial divide that we have and the impact that's happening. George Floyd's murder and death has galvanized us in very unique ways. What's happening with Breonna, um, folks have stepped up and we're having un comfortable conversations and we are leaning into that discomfort in very intentional ways. The fact that those conversations are happening, happening at multiple levels across generations, across the country and across the world is quite significant. We just released a report um, that for focuses on um, police violence and the use of force. And that report um, is called The World is Watching. And that title is very important. Yes. So the fact that the world is watching and that we are uh, beginning to hold ourselves more and more accountable for these violations and that we're leaning into this comfort. We're relying on international law and how that is translated locally. All of these are opportunities um, for optimism. I love that echo. I mean, it's a direct echo to the 1960s civil rights movement, you know, the, the National Convention, Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 1968, where the young protesters were beat up and, and, and assaulted by the police. The whole world is watching, they chanted. Yes. So that, that echoes. And, and I, I do believe that, that this is a time as, as significant as the 60s were in this country with the civil rights movement. And it's wonderful groups like Amnesty International. I see that logo behind you, that, that image of the light coming up through the, the barbed wire and things is, is powerful. Um, all of this takes a lot of resources. And how do you keep it going? How can people get involved and support Amnesty International? I assume you have to do fundraising, obviously. You're not for profit. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, we, we don't accept any government funds. So it's all through individual donors. There are lots of opportunities for you to be a monthly donor. And that's where a lot of our support comes from our members. If you do go on our website at, at um, Amnesty USA, you would see opportunities both to take action and to give there. And I know we've been talking about the importance of telling stories. We also do an event every year it's called our band book week ah, uh, that's coming up yep. september the 27th for a week and this is where we highlight the stories of folks around the world who have been imprisoned threatened or murdered because of what they wrote or published and one key component here is to look at this moment at the role of journalists and the right and freedom of expression. So we have highlighted the case of a journalist, Andrea Sahuri, who was in Iowa and during the Black Lives Matter protests, she kept saying, I'm press, I'm press. They pepper sprayed her on her arms and face at close range. She was cuffed in zip ties and she was arrested. So once again, there's an opportunity to look at her case, call for action, call for accountability, support um, all individuals working on these issues and um, take action. 
get engaged, find out what's going on, educate yourself and encourage your, your dad, like your daughter does, yes. to, to reach out and be part of the movement. I always feel it's young people. Our, our, kids, <laughs> our kids will bring the best or better angels out of us. I, I do believe that. So this has been a wonderful, we appreciate uh, Amnesty International USA uh, getting involved and in, in helping us spread the word about uh, you know police abuse and accountability and uh, the symposium is the time for reckoning and our guest been very gracious with your time Roger Mark D'Souza chief movement building officer of Amnesty International USA Roger Mark thank you for your time and, and, and let's change the world why not right yeah let's do it together absolutely Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.